A figure who's come up in a lot of my videos has been Aphrodite, um, both because I often refer to her when I'm thinking of examples for things, but um, I also get a lot of comments about Aphrodite. And I have noticed it also on other videos from uh, other pagan YouTubers. I've noticed it on Reddit, uh, back in the day when Tumblr was a thing, it was really common on there, um, where people who are beginning their pagan path uh, find themselves very quickly introduced to Aphrodite. This was the case for me. She was my very first uh, goddess that I worked with. After years of dabbling in earth religion and paganism and thinking about maybe wanting to pursue deity, maybe not, um, it was Aphrodite who was my first and introduced me to a whole world of depth psychology and spiritual awakening that I could not have uh, anticipated. So I used to think that goddesses like Aphrodite, Venus, Freya, Isis, Inanna, uh, love goddesses were really common for new pagans because they are love energy. So it makes sense to want to begin with an energy that's just positive and nurturing and uh, just all encompassingly wonderful. <laughs> There's very few downsides to working with a love goddess. So I guess I kind of just chalked it up to, oh, because these goddesses are very welcoming and easy, and Aphrodite is, you know, part of that like Western pop culture that we're all familiar with. It's just a really good gateway. It's a really good first uh, hand extended to you at the arch on the path of the spiritual awakening journey that we all go on. But I really changed my tune on this. I think instead Aphrodite represents uh, more of a cultural shift that's happening to us en masse uh, where we are all awakening to a fondness, a, a gratefulness, a yearning, a need to recognize the divine feminine in all of her aspects um, as a lover, as a sort of sexually free, creatively free. And we are reevaluating where we are as a species right now um, and trying to create more of a, a compass that incorporates um, more archetypes, especially feminine archetypes, in uh, what, what direction we go in the next couple decades, really. So what I wanted to do today was kind of collect experiences of Aphrodite from you guys, um, but not just Aphrodite, also Venus. I know that they're not the same necessarily, um, but they in some cases are a little interchangeable, in some cases not so much, but though I'm talking about Aphrodite and Venus today, I really mean also kind of by extension all love goddesses. So. Inanna, Astarte, Katesh, Freya, Isis, all of these goddesses who sort of fulfill that lover, that sexy woman, that true love goddess energy. Why is it that these goddesses are so common as our first point of call when we enter into the spiritual world? So for me, it was pretty straightforward. I had been dabbling in earth religion for a while, and then I found myself in a really shit relationship with nowhere to go and I decided that I would give it a try. I would create my very first deity altar instead of like a sacred space. I would have a deity altar, it would be for Aphrodite, and I would just see what it was all about. And while yes, Aphrodite absolutely did get me through that relationship, gave me the confidence to end it, to move on, to see myself as a lover, to find better lovers, uh, to embrace some self-love, all of that definitely happened with her. But there were a couple things that I also experienced by working with Aphrodite and Venus because um, I worked with them as interchangeable, um, that I did not see coming and that were definitely uh, part of my foundation that I worked from going, up, going forward. So the first is kind of an expansion on self-love. So though I went to Aphrodite wanting help with loving myself as a lover and finding a partner, that lover's archetype, um, she also taught me how to just look in the mirror and appreciate and love parts of myself that I didn't realize I wasn't offering love to. There's body love, whether that be sexual or health, um, seeing my body as like a vessel that needs to be nurtured and cared for. She taught me how to see things like my creativity as part of what made me sexy and made me special and made me me. Uh, she taught me how to create time for my passions, how to carve out space to just exist, to just feel, to just think about things, uh, to just doodle. Uh, to give myself permission to just explore where my mind and my heart might take me. She also really taught me how to set better boundaries with people, um, especially in a loving way uh, where there was no pain or tension on either end of that, of that gate, I guess, but how to, how to 
draw a line in the sand that is still loving and firm and welcoming all in one. Another thing I didn't really see coming with Aphrodite was how she made an impact on my mental health. Um, for my whole life, really, I really struggled with uh, experiences of guilt alongside joy and pleasure. Um, that has been everything from like sexual pleasure to just like having a good time with my friends and laughing freely. Like anything that is pure joy and fun and pleasurable has always come with this like weird misty fog of guilt to the point where for a long time I was just purposefully not enjoying myself to the fullest in order to avoid that layer of guilt. Uh, so working with Aphrodite over a couple of years was a really cool experience of facilitating permission to experience joy and pleasure with no strings attached, with no guilt involved. Uh, that, that was a really, really valuable lesson for me that just has shaped uh, everything that I am now and continue to try to, to strive for. You're likely very familiar with the Birth of Venus painting, um, but I actually want to talk about one of my favorite depictions of Aphrodite, which is the Aphrodite of Nidos. This comes to us from around like 400, 300 BCE, and though it's a little similar to the Birth of Venus in posture, the Birth of Venus was actually inspired by this statue um, with her hands sort of covering her vulva. This statue also carries a lot of story and symbolism, both as a piece of art and as a sacred object in historical times. Aphrodite literally means foam, which when you equate the waters and the rhythm of the sea waves with sexual energy, you can see why foam might have that sort of orgasmic or deeply sensual imagery attached to it. Now the original Greek Aphrodite of Nidos is long gone, but we know about it through many Roman copies of the work, which is what we have today. The statue was not only life-size, but also so lifelike that it aroused men, to the point where one guy broke into the temple after nightfall, tried to have sex with it, and left a stain, and he was so ashamed of what he had done that he threw himself from the temple and died. But a sexual response to the statue wasn't necessarily bad. The temple staff actually encouraged it, and reacting to her, being aroused by her, was sort of part of that sacred experience. We have writings from Erites about how the actual court of Aphrodite was not made sterile with stone pavement, but was allowed to be a verdant green with fruit trees and lush foliage. It was just fertility. This statue was actually one of the first nude women statues in Greek history. Prior to that, nudity was reserved for depictions of heroism, which of course was men. And today we have our own Aphrodites, everything from Marilyn Monroe to Beyonce. We have these like major cultural figures who represent this voluptuous sexual woman who is creative and powerful and attractive and almost like out of reach and I love that archetype. What a cool archetype. This sort of leads me to my theory of deity um, which is kind of a blend I guess of two primary ones in the in the pagan community. So there is hard polytheism where you believe that the gods are uh, distinct individual beings uh, that exist probably in a higher dimensional plane. Uh, and then there's the belief that there are archetypes in the universe, like energetic archetypes in the universe or in our psychology that we then construct characters over. Um, and so a love goddess on any continent or from any culture is an archetype of a love goddess that we then paint uh, a being over and create stories about. So for me, I believe both. I think that the human psyche is built to understand the world through archetype. I think that's just how we interpret reality. The archetypes of the tarot are a really good example of this. But then I think that the gods are these beings who we can sort of plug in to these, uh, these archetypes that surround our consciousness uh, and learn from them and their stories and their personalities. And they can kind of fill that role. Um, but even they are not that pure archetypal energy. They, they, they just play that role for us in our, in our psychology. That's just my theory though, so take for that what you will. Uh, but that kind of leads me into why this is not just about Aphrodite, but this is also about love goddesses as a whole. Why they specifically are the ones who come to us at the beginning of our spiritual journey. Is it because we're going through this grand awakening of what the divine feminine really is? Is it because we are coming to terms with how we've treated the environment and the earth 
and we're realizing uh, what it means to really give and take? Are we going through like a major sexual revolution where we fully understand or better understand maybe uh, the body, gender, sex, um, sexuality, relationship, uh, what it means to, to be part of a, of, of a marriage or a relationship or a family unit? What do those look like? What does that look like in the future? If you want to solve these mass societal issues, you need to wind all the way back as far as you can and find a sense of self. And once you have a sense of self, you can understand yourself in relationship to another and then another and another and so on and so forth until you do reach that like societal level and global citizen sort of level. So I think for a spiritual person, you begin your journey back at phase one, back into like, okay, here's me, who am I and who am I in relationship to others? What does that loving bond look like? And a love goddess is that first lesson. And it's really hard to progress to um, a greater network of love if you don't have that foundation of love for another, right? How, how can you do that? Your first experience is with another, whether it be a baby with their parent or guardian, um, a pet with their owner or you with your pet. Um, there, there has to be that other experience before we can branch out into a, a collective one. And so if you're starting a spiritual path, what a great way to start is a love goddess. So for me, Aphrodite was really important. She taught me that. She taught me how to love myself, love another person, select a better partner, be a better partner. And then from there, I was able to grow in new ways. So that's my Aphrodite spiel. And I would really love to hear what you have to say about your experience with Aphrodite. When on your spiritual journey that came, was it the beginning? Was she a catalyst somewhere down the road? Are you working with her now? And what your experience has been? Of course, with Aphrodite, I also mean Venus or Inanna or Isis or any love goddess. I would really love to know what your experience has been. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you're new around here, hi, my name is Sarai Aura. Good to meet you. I hope you're staying safe and healthy and drinking plenty of water and getting as much sunlight as you can on your face because it is spring and it's time to just soak that in because we're gonna need it to carry us into the rest of this year. Have a beautiful day, bye.